Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV. And it, it, it is, of course, Masters of the Air Week. And my guest today is Dr. Hattie Hearn, the curator at the American Air Museum at IWM Duxford. She's going to talk about the 100th Bomb Group, give a bit of a historical context and of hope as well, kind of discuss a little bit the British reaction within the museum community to Masters of the Air and whether it will have an effect on tourism and visitor numbers and long term understanding of the air, a strategic bombing campaign. But I'll bring her in now. Good evening, Hattie. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Well, apart from this damn cold, I'm all right. <laughs> so, um, you know, we were just talking before going live. We've got one episode to go of the show. And obviously, even though people like ourselves, we can see things that are little, not, that, well, they, why do they do that? And all that's an interesting choice there. But I'm assuming you're loving it like most of us. I am. I look forward to, to Friday nights like never before. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I think casting aside any kind of historical inaccur inaccuracies that you might be able to pick up. Um, it's just entertainment. And it's the first time that um, we've ever kind of got to see the air combat action brought to life so so intensely um, and on such a huge scale. And I think as a historian, um, that's what's really impacted me because you can read so many different veteran testimonies and accounts, but actually seeing it brought to life um, it's, it's just very, very effective and impactful. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I like you, I read lots of books and books move me and I learn lots from books and I put a book down. I know it's changed me, but during the watching of some of these episodes, I've been repeatedly saying during it, fuck, because you're just seeing something that you've tried to visualize and never been able to. And there it is depicted there for you in a way that you know with all our love for the memphis bell and 12 o'clock high and all the classic movies never been done and yes sometimes the cgi you could say well that didn't look but you know everyone's watching on different devices and different size screens and different distances but it's been an amazing thing anyway we're not here to talk about the, the review of the tv show as such um we're here to talk about the hundred bomb group so i'll bring up your powerpoint and folks We'll kind of do questions as we go along, or I'm pretty certain that Hattie's presentation will cover most of the things, but we'll do some at the end and some as we go along. But I'm going to hand over to Dr. Hearn to kind of take us to the legend of the bloody hundred. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of um, background about my, my own personal interests. So um, I'm the curator of the American Air Museum, so I'm lucky enough to spend a lot of my day um, researching 8th Air Force history. Um, but I've also got a particular interest in the 100 Bomb Group. Um, for the last five years, I've been a volunteer at the 100 Bomb Group Museum in Thorpe Abbotts. And I've also um, completed my PhD thesis, um, which looked at the identity and culture of 8th Air Force Bomb Groups. So I, I was really interested in how bomb groups develop their own sense of identity and how that kind of translated into the material culture of the bases um, to create these kind of distinct localities. And I, I think Thorpe Abbotts and the 100 Bomb Group is certainly a very special example of that. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote from Harry Crosby. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize that name from Masters of the Air. Um, he is the narrator of the series. And he said, um, the 100th has always provided the stuff of history and legend. During the war and since, airmen have told and retold the 100 stories. And um, Harry Crosby should really know about that because, um, like I said, he um, is a central figure in the, the story of the 100th. He's one of the few um, original crew members to actually be at Thorpe Abbotts for the whole of the hundreds time in England. Um, so it's unsurprising that his book, A Wing in the Prayer, was used as the, the main source material for Masters of the Air. But Crosby himself often questioned why the hundred was so special. Um, and despite being one of the most famous USAF um, bomb groups of the Second World War, uh, it's interesting to note that the, that the 100 wasn't really statistically noteworthy. Um, they, they won numerous awards, including a couple of presidential unit citations, but there were lots more groups that won more. Um, they didn't actually fly the most missions or drop the most bombs, and they didn't suffer the highest casualties, uh, although their, their casualties were very, very high. Um, so where does the legend of the Bloody Hundred come, come from? Um, that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about in today's presentation. Um, we're going to start to dissect some of the folklore and mythology that surround this, this infamous group and attempt to separate fact from fiction. Let's see if I can move to the next slide. 
So let's get started um, right at the beginning of the, the hundreds history. Um, so it all kind of started really um, in, on the 1st of June 1942, which is when the 100 Bomb Group was activated. And they trained at various uh, fields in the US, including Walla Walla, Wendover, um, and they ended up in Kearney, Nebraska. And it was here in May 1943 that the 100 were finally directed to begin their journey to England. And this news was met with a lot of excitement, but also relief. Relief because up until that point, the 100 um, hadn't exactly covered itself in glory. Uh, during its training, um, it had been suffered kind of very a very disjointed training schedule. They didn't actually receive their first B-17s until November 1942. And they'd also been sent off to various other um, stations in, in the US to help train crews for other bomb groups. And there was actually a time when, when it was feared that the 100th would be disbanded and its crews would be sent as replacement crews to other 8th Air Force bomb groups. And one particular incident of note occurred um, towards the end of the training when the bomb group was uh, ordered to conduct a practice mission um, over to California. And during this mission, three of the, the bombers did, got lost and ended up in Las Vegas. And another bomber ended up in Tennessee in the completely opposite direction. Um, and it was later found out that the pilot's girlfriend actually lived in the town in Tennessee that the P-17 landed mm. at. Um, so it kind of had already got this reputation as being a kind of ill-disciplined um, group. And that was kind of enough to, to earn it a bit of a hard luck um, reputation. And the other major kind of distinguishing feature of the 100 Bomb Group was its personnel. So the vast majority of personnel um, were from were basically civilians in uniform. Um, and as this quote says, there were a few veterans of peacetime service to disseminate military wisdom and procedure, though the 100th group soon evolved a way of life which was frequently at variance with old army tradition. And that's certainly the case with the two leading men of the 100th, um, John Buck Bucky Egan and Gail Buck Clevin, who you can see pictured here. And Harry Crosby um, had gave a brilliant description of, of them both. He described them as dashing, undisciplined, superb pilots, exactly what Hollywood expected them to be. And obviously it just so happens that, that they would go on to become you know, Hollywood characters in their own right in Masters of the Air. And um, these guys were what Harry Crosby described as kind of romanticists. They embodied the image of the kind of pre-war fly boy. Um, they were very individ individualistic and they they kind of wanted to prove themselves uh, and they pr were probably um, so self-confident that they, they thought they could win, win the war single-handedly. And as you can see from their picture here, they're wearing their um, 50 Mission Crush uh -huh. style caps, uh, which was a look that was achieved by removing um, the, uh, the band from the cap. Um, and then when you put the headphones over, um, it would create this kind of crushed effect, which gave the impression of a, a much more seasoned combat veteran. Um, you'll also see that Egan is sporting a moustache. Um, this was most likely the result of a competition that was held um, at Kearney when the 100 Bomb Group um, had had a moustache growing competition. And the idea was that the, the guys who, who grew the worst moustaches would then host a dinner for, for the guys with the, the best face furniture. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure about Egan's effort there. Yes, not, lo not looking the best in that particular photo. But just a quick question for you, Hattie, because John... All, all of yesterday said that he was trying to definitely incorporate into narrative the transition of the early guys within the bomb group to the latter guys and that there is a sort of distinct difference the early guys had seen films like test pilot in 1938 and dive bomb and is, this, is that something you've kind of seen in your research either generally within the eighth or within the hundred there's kind of these two distinct eras definitely yeah the the 100 bomb group that went over in the summer of 1943 was a completely different outfit to the, the bomb group that um, emerged even kind of late 1943, early 1944. Um, not only had they had a, a huge change in personnel because so many, um, as we'll let you see, um, got shot down, um, but also because they, they kind of learned on the job and that kind of uh, swagger that they had during their, their stateside days really had kind of vanished in 
it, and been replaced with a much more disciplined um, culture. Um, so yeah, it, it the, you do get to see that in Masters of the Air, that transition. And I think that's really embodied in the comparison between um, the likes of Clevin and Egan and then um, Rosie Rosenthal, who, who only came in um, sort of a couple of months after um, Egan and Clevin, but he seems to embody this much more kind of down to earth, sensible. Kind of a transitional kind of character, isn't he, in a yes. sense? He's kind of bridging the two worlds, isn't it? And mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a recurring theme on World War II TV is that other units within the war, you know, things like the SAS, they kind of start out very haphazard and, and you know friends of friends come and go and then by the end they're very much a sort of structured organ, organized regiment and the, you know the the eighth air force it will though a much bigger organization goes through that same kind of process of of, of becoming more and more of a of a, of a business which is kind of what the theme mm. of jo joseph heller in cash 22 if that's not a massive great rabbit hole to go down in the u.s army air force is essentially kind of a big business yeah yeah you're, you're spot on really and and um as the strength of the 8th Air Force increased um, as the war went on. Um, you do see, you do see that that there's much more kind of standardization. There's much more discipline. Um, everyone kind of knows their job by that point, and they know exactly what their mission is. Um, so yeah, it, I think it has to be as well. And the whole um, success of bombing war really relies on. Right crews and squadrons and groups and wings um, all working together. Um, so even though um, each each bomb group kind of developed its own distinct identity, I think there was still like that common mission and that um, that common kind of standardization of tactics and, and an right. approach to the, the mission. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, um, so in June 1943, the 100 had finally made, made their way to Thorpe Abbots, to Station 139. Uh, and Thorpe Abbots is located on the Norfolk-Suffolk border, about five miles from the town of Dis and about 20 miles south of the city of Norwich. And it was a, a completely new air base that had been built. Um, the 100 were the first bomb group to serve there. And the construction teams were still working away as the as 100 the settled in. And I love this quote from um, John R. Nilsson in the story of the century, which was written just towards the latter end of the war. And it describes the scene in, in June of 1943 um, that met the, the 100 bomb group. And so he says, the time, early June of 1943, the mist hung stationary in the night air and the English countryside, so wan and haggard, wore a dismal cloak. The Nissen huts hunched up in the blackout, ghosts at night or by day, huge tin cans rip ripped in half. It was an airbase and new from which the RAF as Arabs in the night had pulled up his tents and departed. So Nilsson's describing um, the moment that the RAF officially hand over the base to the Americans. Um, and oh, I've got a map here of of the airfield just to give you a sense of, of the layout so um it's a very much a standard class a um airfield we've got three runways um and we've got the technical site there's also two t2 hangars um and then the so there's about six domestic living sites and each of the four um, squadrons had its own um, living site um we've also got the two communal sites and then the various kind of infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's interesting to know actually that the local village of Thorpe, of, um, Thorpe Abbott, which is only uh, a, a short distance away, didn't have its own kind of sewage net system at that point. So this was the first time that that they um, had been able to actually take advantage of um, a, a sewage network. So yeah, the Americans brought that to Thorpe Abbott's. Um, right, so soon the 100 would get its first taste of com combat and that first mission on the 25th of june 1943 was to bomb um, submarine pens in bremen um so the as you can imagine at this point the the 100 are quite confident in their abilities um but it would soon turn soon become apparent that actually this whole um bombing warfare malarkey wasn't as easy as they first thought so uh, the mission to Bremen um, uh, um, would require the the bombers to kind of skirt um, round into the into the, the kind of port of Bremen, drop their bombs, um, but they were quickly met with um, Luftwaffe resistance, mm -hmm. and they lost. 
three of their bombers. Um, and obviously each B-17 had a 10-man crew, so that's 30 men. And if you consider that the 100th only arrived with 35 crews, so sort of 350 men, that's actually quite a large proportion, just wiped yeah. out on their first mission. Um, and that is kind of, is almost quite ominous for the next three months because um, as, as I'll explain, over the course of several kind of big missions, the 100th suffered some huge losses. So by the 14th of October, by the end of Black Week, um, only well 27th of the original 35 crews have been lost. Um, and so that is really where this legend of the bloody 100th comes from. So the uh, Regensburg mission, which is also featured in Masters of the Air, was uh, a huge kind of moment in the, the cultural history of the 100th Bomb Group. Um, so the mission occurred on the, the 17th of August 1943, um, and it was a, a long distance mission into the heart of Germany, which would require the 100th to drop their bombs on to Messerschmitt factories before then heading south to North Africa. And the mission was part of a two-pronged raid with the eighth's strength split between um, the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt and the factories at Regensburg. And the 100th ended up being uh, at the last and lowest group in the formation, um, uh, often referred to as Coffin Corner, and it was a really dangerous place to be. Um, and they'd soon find out why. So the 100th won over enemy territory long before waves of Fokker Wolf 190s and Emi 109s started to wreak havoc on the bomber stream. Um, and they it seemed that they were concentrating their fire on the planes of the 100th. Um, and soon the sky was, was strewn with um, parts of B-17s, parachutes and fighters, as I think is so beautifully kind of replicated in Masters of the Air. Um, and this assault actually con continued for an hour and a half. So you can just imagine how exhausted those crews that made it through were after, you know, fighting for over 90 minutes. Um, and this was before they'd actually reached their target. So they actually managed to drop their bombs very accurately on the factory complex. Um, so it was a complete success in that respect. Um, and then the, the battered B-17s started to make their way to North Africa. And on this mission, the 100th lost nine aircraft, which was almost half the strength that had taken off from Thorpe Abbott's. So it really was a, a kind of baptism of fire um, for the guys. And um, yeah, what I find quite, quite interesting is that despite suffering these kind of really enormous losses, there's so many photographs, like the one we see here, of the crews kind of enjoying their time in North Africa. Um, and obviously they're press photos, so there's an element of kind of staging going on there. But there are some quite amusing anecdotes to emerge from, from this um, shuttle mission. Um, and one of those uh, refers to Owen Cowboy Roan, who was one of the, the more colourful characters of the original 100th. Um, and wh while he, him and his crew were in Africa, they decide, decided to adopt an African donkey, which they nicknamed Mo, and she's pictured um, on the slide. And they decided that they would take her back to Thorpe Abbott's with them. Um, now, the only problem was that actually on their way back to Thorpe Abbott's, they were um, required to actually conduct another bombing mission. So it's I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure in saying that Mo was the only donkey to ever actually fly a combat mission in the B-17. Um, and they, they made sure she was quite well cared for. They put an oxygen mask on her, um, although it soon became apparent that actually the, the poor donkey used to the deserts of North Africa um, wasn't quite um, used to the, the cold conditions in a B-17. So so they, they managed to kind of wrap her up and, and keep her going. Um, and as they approached Thorpe Abbott's, Roan allegedly declared um, on the intercom that he was coming in with a frozen ass, which is one of those um, anecdotes that's kind of been passed down and has uh, entered the legend of the 100th. Um, unfortunately, actually, there's a kind of a sad ending to that story in that Mo, um, Mo the donkey didn't actually last very long at Thorpe Abbott's. I think mm. partly because of the weather, partly because she's um, she had to live on a, a diet mainly of sweets um, fed to her by the Americans. So it oh, didn't end God. very well. Not and she's apparently buried at Thorpe Abbott's. Donkey diabetes. Yeah, terrible. Yeah. 
And just, just because you said earlier, Katty, about the you know the coffin corner position and things like that. Mm-hmm. And as a historian watching the TV show, I, I I want to know what you think. But I felt there were lots of terms used that the viewer, if they wanted to, could then go and Google later on and find a little bit more about how bomb formations were put together. They didn't they didn't tell you everything. They they they, they they anticipated the audience being adults and able to go and look mm. on stuff. Did you kind of see it that way, that there was a good sprinkling of terminology yeah. without without dumbing it down in such a way that, you know, people go, oh, come on, we know how aircraft fly. It was, I, I thought it was handled well. Do you, do you think the same? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, I, I like the use of kind of terminology of, of the period, which might, for the general viewer, probably doesn't make much sense. But like you said, they can go off and find out. But I think actually including that it doesn't dist- distract from the, from the, the main storyline so they're not kind of filling it with loads of exposition um and it's really kind of yeah puts you in the moment so yeah i, I i'm with you on that i think well, the, the script was very good in that respect thank you and another quick question we just had well, i don't want to ask it why why it's there and i'm kind of reword it so like jeff is saying was the hundred ever at full strength so someone you know an eight there for um historian it seems to me they're always struggling with new crews coming in keeping aircraft in it it was any bomb group ever at full strength ever or, or is it is always a constant battle to keep keep maintain that that strength mm. yeah that's a really good question i don't know the exact answer um because obviously there were so many bomb groups operating in the eighth air force um but i certainly know that at, at certain points in in the history of the hundred they were kind of almost to the point where they where couldn't continue operationally and i think that was uh, particularly the case of of most bomb groups um, after Black Week in uh, 1943, um, October 1943, when when they suffered such enormous losses that they were that they couldn't continue re- or kind of couldn't do long range um, missions into Germany until um, late 1943, early 1944. Um, but we do see that a massive build up of of strength um, prior to D Day. Um, there's new new gr- complete groups coming, um, but then also lots of replacement crews. And also, uh, as I kind of get to the the losses at that point have have gone down as enough that they can be replaced. So I, I yeah I, I I'm not 100, but I would imagine that by kind of the the summer of a uh, spring summer of 1944, they were at a, a point where they could maintain their strength. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so. Uh, let's move on to the next big mission in the history of the hundred, and that is Munster. Um, so Munster comes um, in the middle of Black Week, which was a, a week that's kind of gone down in the, the folklore of the Eighth Air Force as being a disastrous week. Um, it was a, a kind of week filled with long range uh, penetration missions into Germany. And pretty much all of the the Eighth Air Force groups suffered huge casualties, and the hundred certainly didn't come off lightly. Um, so they'd already flown uh, two missions in Black Week, and uh, they'd flown to Bremen, um, where they'd suffered again. They suffered heavy losses, and it was during that mission that um, Major Gail Clevin went down, um, which we see in Masters of the Air with uh, that that great scene where. Um, where Egan's talking on the phone to the base and he's using all the baseball terminology. Um, so he's he's on this next mission. He's on the monster mission. He wants to try to avenge the death, or not the death, or but kind of the the loss of his friend. Um, so the the target for for the day is uh, the actual center of monster, which is the first time that the hundred have really had to actually target a civilian. Um, target, you, they're used to targeting kind of railway yards and factory complexes and U-boat pens. And as we see in Masters of the Air, there's, there is some controversy over this, um, particularly as it's, uh, they, they work out that the time the bombs will fall is, is a, a time that a lot of uh, local people will be out in the streets and coming out of the cathedral. Um, but nevertheless, they get in their B-17s and they go towards the target. Um, and a couple of, of B-17s of the Hunjiv drop out for mechanical reasons, but of the, the, the 13 aircraft um, that go go towards the Raw, they're, they're met by this huge defending force of over 350 German fighters. So you can imagine just a wave, a huge wave of, of opposition. And uh, Frank Murphy, who's one of the, the 
men who flew that mission um, recalled that the fighters came on at a tremendous closing speed with complete disregard for the curtain of defensive fire from our guns, the leading edges of their wings twinkling and glittering as they fired. Exploding cannon shells walked through our formation. Mm. You can almost picture the, the chaos of that situation. Um, and it was also a kind of B-17 crew's worst nightmare to have this full-on frontal attack um, where you're kind of at your most vulnerable. And that was something that I think Donald Miller mentioned, and I think possibly um, Ty did on, on Tuesday, is that the 8th Air Force strategic bombing, there is no, you can't outflank. You can't go around the back. You can't, you end up just having to fly pretty much directly to a target and kind of mm -hmm. forcing your way through with, with brute strength to, to varying degrees of, of um, success as the, as the war went on. I think that's something, again, that has been conveyed very well. The, it's kind of a blunt precision tool if that's not a paradox at the same time it's 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 technologically super advanced but it is at the same time do you just go in you kick the front door in mm. hopefully yeah yeah you're so vulnerable and even though your instincts telling you to to perform some evasive maneuvers to try to get out of the way uh the statistics show that the that you're most likely to survive if you stay in a formation and the germans had their most successes when they could get in amongst the formations and break um break groups break squad squadrons up um so yeah it's uh it's just a crazy situation and i think one that's quite unique in the whole of, of combat really mm. um so certainly for of uh, the hundred for, on this mission they they did feel kind of like sitting sitting ducks um and then obviously uh, as well after the 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 fighters are finished um you kind of know actually the worst is probably still to come because usually flak takes their place and that was certainly the, the case at munster and um a lot of damage was caused by flak the 100 managed to get off their, their payloads um, and they actually devastated the city centre. Um, so, the, yeah, their, their, their bombs hit their targets. But the ordeal wasn't over yet. So as they made their way home, um, the six remaining B-17s of the 100 were then set upon by the fighters again. Um, and back at Thorpe Abbott's, you can kind of imagine the scene uh, of the ground personnel um, just waiting for, for their planes to reappear in the sky. Um, and there's just kind of a silence as one one plane, one B-17 comes in um, firing its, its flare to kind of indicate that there's wounded on board. And that B-17 is Royal Flush, which is piloted by Robert Rosie Rosenthal. Um, the, the B-17 had two engines out, had a gaping hole in one wing and also three injured gunners on board. And Rosie, uh, who's kind of an amazing character in his own right, um, he had managed to perform some amazing, um, almost on the verge of being impossible, evasive maneuvers to, to tr like you said, kind of outflank the, the German fighters um, and to make it back to Thor Babbitt's. Um, and he was actually only on his third mission at this point. And is, he apparently said as he, as he got off his, his plane, I hope they're not all as bad as this because he mm. had arrived at the 100 and the worst possible week um, of the whole war. Um, and he would go on to achieve some extraordinary feats and he would become a hugely respected character in the 100 Bomb Group. Um, after his tour of 25 missions was complete, um, he signed up for another um, 30 missions um, and he got shot down twice. And I think in this next episode, we're going to see. Um, we're going we're we're to get to see a really cool. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no cool spoilers there. But, I believe. No um, spoilers. And... Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, yeah, he is one of those central figures in the 100 of history that has, um, that, particularly this mission, that just has what the one thing that was really kind of secured the hundred other groups suffered more losses but that monster raid and that image of one lone bomber coming into land i think that's really been a catalyst for and i just wanted to ask you well i'm sorry to keep derailing you but you know given that you work in in britain with a museum that's about the american air war but it's kind of for a you know in within british geography I, do, do you agree that trying to convey the importance of somewhere like Thorpe Abbott's being a community of both American personnel and the people and the locals in the village and the, you know, they, they showed the kids on the airfield and they showed the Irish workmen still you know, putting the runaways in, in, the, in the early episodes, that, that's an important aspect to convey, is it? Because, because that was very much how it was when Clive Stevens was on our channel last year talking about the relationships between these communities, not just during the war, but for decades afterwards. And, mm. and you know, the Cold War era changed that a lot. I grew up in the sort of 70s and 80s when the bases in East Anglia were very much kind of cut off because of 
of the way it was back then. But it, it was an important aspect that it was kind of the, the whole community would watch the aircraft le leaving and coming back, wouldn't they? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I was reading a, a diary from a young lad uh, called John Archer who would cycle, um, it must have been about sort of seven or eight miles um, from his, his home in Bungie to, to Thorpe Abbott's. Um, every day to watch the B-17s take off. And, and he wrote in his notebook all of the the, mm. uh, the names and he would then come back and, and count them all back in again. And there was this huge connection, um, an emotional connection that developed. A lot of the local people had um, sons and husbands serving away um, with the British Army and British forces. And so the Americans were kind of almost like surrogate sons in a way. Um, and there's, there's just... Every, every account really from, from a 100 Bomb Group veteran or an 8th Air Force veteran in general has some aspect of their relationship with the local community and 99% of them are, are positive experiences um, showing their hospitality. Um, it went both ways really. Uh, the particular relationships that stand out are the ones between between the personnel and their young children, um, like which we, we see in Masters of the Air. Yeah. There were no, no kind of barbed wire fences. Um, children were quite uh, were quite able to kind of walk onto the airfield. Um, they often had been adopted by um, crews, and like, there's even some instances of them being taken up on kind of joyrides. So, yeah, it, that relationship's really special, and I think that's part of the reason that we we still remember groups like the Hundred Bomb Group because of the work of volunteers over here um, to preserve their memory. Um, yeah, so and, and the fact that when we talk about the impact of the combined bomber offensive globally and that you know we should be talking about the ninth, 15th air force and the 20th air force and bomber command around the world is that some of these other um air formations didn't have the the option of having any kind of civilian interaction because they were tents in the middle of nowhere you know some of the units yeah. flying out of, of of north africa for example there was no local community with a pub with a church and a women's institute group to kind of get to connect with so i think that that is a slightly unique aspect of the 8th Air Force. And I guess also Bomber Command slightly further north in Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire and what have you. But I think that was something that, that is, is important to convey in any history of, of the 8th, that, that civilian uh, military um, cooperation. But yeah, that, thanks for expanding on that. I, I, I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, where are we? Um, so... Um, so after the the horror of, of the summer of uh, and or early autumn of of 1943 um the 100 bomb group, bomb group kind of lies low for a little bit there's there's some rumors that the the group might even be dis disbanded because of the, the heavy losses that it suffered um luckily that's not the case and replacements do come in to to fill those gaps um but interestingly uh, from this point on really the 100 the hundreds reputation would grow to the extent that even um, new crews in the United States had heard about the bloody hundred. Um, and I'm just going re to read out quickly this quote from Harry Crosby. Um, so he describes how in late 1945, I was talking to a young pilot who had been assigned to the hundred. Although he was supremely, even brashly confident about himself and his crew, he was worried. Yes, he was afraid. He said that when he was in stateside training, he already had heard of the bloody hundred, the hard luck outfit of World War II. He'd heard the story of how the Luftwaffe was waging its own special war against our group. He told me stories about our group, most of which I, from one of the original crews who had come over on May 31st, 1943, had never even heard. The Bloody Hundred was already the group about which legends were developing. Um, and and so that, that's, that's a point in itself that the Hundred Bomb Group, um, it, it wasn't kind of a post-war creation of, of legend. This was very much happening um, it, just within a matter of, kind of months after the, the awful events um, of, the, of its, their early time in 1943. Um, and the, he references here um, a kind of a vendetta by the, the Luftwaffe. Um, the Luftwaffe was waging its own special war against our group. And that's quite an interesting part of the, the 100th legend. Um, so during the war, there was this, this um, rumour that uh, a, during a mission, a 100 bomb group plane had dropped its wheels down, which was a kind of a mutually um, 
accepted sign of surrender. But then when a Luftwaffe fighter came alongside it to escort it down, it, the B-17 opened fire and, and shot down the German fighter. And that kind of stained the reputation of the 100th. Um, mm. And the argument was that after that, the, the Germans kind of had a vendetta against the 100th. So they would always aim aim to, to shoot down as many um, uh, planes of that group. Um, this this uh, rumor has actually been disproven multiple times. Um, it's just the very idea that the Luftwaffe might have targeted a specific group just based on one incident is like, very unlikely. Um, but nevertheless, during the war, it stuck. And it was the thing that often accompanied the, this legend of the, of the bloody hundred. And but that's how nicknames stick. And we've done it so many times on the channel, the devils in red tails and the, 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 the you often there's no exact source you can verify for where these things start but then a name gets out because because rob crane asked in the sidebar uh, and this is obviously the subject of your work what did the propaganda guys make of the nickname bloody isn't exactly encouraging it's kind of a but it's it's the underdog idea though is kind is is a is an eternal one isn't it so yeah, yeah. Ha, ha, nicknames and reputations it's a you can turn a negative into a positive or a positive into a negative i'm guessing you can, yeah, and the eight therefore seem to have a remarkable way of doing that. Um, like for example, there's there's the 44th Bomb Group, um, which was a B24 unit um, in the Eighth Air Force, and their insignia was um, an eight ball. Um, and again, that's all to do with with luck. There was an idea that they were a hard luck outfit. So luck's actually just um, in general is like a very common theme in nose art on certain planes, um, and. Um, yeah, I think that there was this ability to, to somehow kind of see, just flip things on its head slightly. Um, so the Bloody Hundred was actually kind of worn as as a, a term of, of kind of something to be proud of, that we are survivors as much as um, as veterans. Um, so, yeah, you, it's a good point, though. You know, you would have imagined that there would have been maybe a bit more censored. Um, but in terms of morale, actually, I think it kind of, had the opposite effect. It, it rallied the men and it gave them a sense of identity. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's a complex thing, isn't it? And it's, I mean, mm. as an Ipswich Town fan, we were called the Tractor Boys as an insult 30 years ago. And then, but <laughs> then the Ipswich fans claimed it and call ourselves the Tractor Boys now. So it started as something people use negatively about our supporters, but now we've taken ownership mm. of it. And that's, yeah. you see that with military units, you know, that someone yeah. else calls a unit something slightly negative and then, and then it can, it can becomes adopted, but kind of, as I say, the positive spin put on it. It's a, it's a, it's an ideal subject for a, for a World War II TV show about how names mm. that began possibly negatively became, became the opposite. Um, and, mm. and, and then, and then extend beyond their lifetime. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a rabbit hole for, for another future show. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, actually kind of expanding on the, on that idea, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about flak stories. Yeah. Um, so flak stories were were stories that were told around the kind of potbelly stove or in the officers club. Um, and they were um, they were designed to to initiate new replacement crews um, into the kind of culture and the history of of the bomb group. And they were, kind of, I suppose, to prepare them, but also to intimidate them um, and to, to scare them slightly. And I think that that story uh, with the, the the vendetta story actually was probably a flak story um, that emerged <clears throat> as a way to kind of give a little bit of a rough edge to, to the hundred bomb group, and also maybe to justify why they were suffering so so many losses. Um, an, an argument for for um, these heavy losses would would be that is because they didn't actually undergo great training in the states um, and they were quite ill-disciplined when they first arrived but um, maybe instead of accepting the reality there was a tendency to develop these these um, stories and one particular um, flak story that I'd just like to, to touch upon is the story of Eddie the Ghost so um, Eddie the Ghost is is a story that has been passed down the generations and it's still very much alive today. So there's um, a story that goes that, that that a ghost called Eddie still haunts the control tower at Thorpe Abbotts. Um, and this is, he's been sighted at numerous windows, um, especially at night. And I was really interested to actually read the, the his, some of the, 
the operational records of the 100 Bomb Group, and I saw multiple references to Eddie the Ghost, um, which showed that he was actually in existence during the war. And there's numerous kind of backstories, but the most uh, popular one was that he was, was a ghostly airman described as being eight or nine foot tall, who patrolled Thorpe Abbott's barrack huts um, at night. And the rumour had it, um, rumour was that it was the ghost of an unfortunate airman who got shot down um, on one of the group's missions to Berlin. Um, he was destined to return to the base in search of his next victim. There's another story that he was actually uh, an airman, airman who um, received a Dear John letter and subsequently um, shot himself. So there's numerous kind of backstories. Um, but if people were talking about this story so much and people were so scared that that some men were actually hanging their, their carbines above their bed um, just in case Eddie would appear. I'm not sure what good um, shooting a ghost would do really, but um, yes, yeah, but that's what happened. And the CEO um, at the time actually issued a ban, um, banning all talk of Eddie on penalty of court martial. Um, so yeah, I find that one a really interesting flag story that was obviously created just to scare, intimidate new recruits, but had a real impact actually on the day-to-day -to -day life of the group and has actually managed to survive and develop um, over the years uh, so it's still in existence today. Um, and of course, there needed to be some spaces on the base to tell these flag stories, to get together and, and to kind of sow the seeds of the, the group's legend. Um, that, so there's multiple places at Thorpe Abbott's where you could do, do that. There's the Officers Club, which is featured a lot in Masters of the Air. Uh, it was decorated in a kind of Art Deco style. It had this circular bar, um, which was believed to be the only circular bar in, in the European theatre. Um, so the 100 were very proud of that. And um, and yeah, it was a place to socialize and to relax after after a tough day's mission. And it was the the, the favorite haunt of um, Gail Clevin and John Egan. But for the non-commissioned officers, there was also the NCOs club, which had a, a Western theme. It was all kind of decked out in wood paneling and, um, and yeah, and, and painted with Western style murals. There's also the Big Top Club, which was another very popular venue for drinking and dancing. And that was open to NCOs and also paid up members of the Big Top. Um, and then finally, there was, there was a sad, sad sack shack, which was interestingly opened after uh, the 100 were banned from all of the local pubs. Um, <laughs> there were so many complaints from local people. So they built this huge saloon, which um, just had these massive barrels of warm Suffolk um, white bread beer, which was apparently um, very unripe, according to a description, um, and kind of Find the quote. I think it, it rotted the the corroded youthful stomachs, according to one oh. review. <laughs> um, so a much tamer alternative to those establishments was the Red Cross Aero Club, and the Red Cross clubs um, ev every base had one, and they were run by American Red Cross workers and supported by a whole army of British staff as well, um, and at Thorpe Abbotts. Uh, the club was run by Betty Hardman and Hilda Purse and Dorothy Durang. And we do see some Red Cross workers in Masters of the Air. And they, as well as running the club, they would also be there before the mission and also after to hand out coffee and donuts. And uh, it was basically just, they, they, they were there to provide a taste of home away from home. So the club would be fitted out with uh, a reading room, a space to write letters, a gramophone, pool table, um, ping pong table, and obviously a snack bar as well, where they could serve um, all manner of, of snacks, but no alcohol, importantly. Um, and lastly, I just want to, to comment on, on a kind of interesting subject that is, I think, really important to the culture of the 100 Bomb Group, but probably doesn't get mentioned enough. So in Harry Crosby's writings, he um, he writes a, about what made the 100 Bond Group so special. And he concluded, um, rather interestingly, that what made the 100 a unique group of people and what brought them together was their love of music. So he talks about how before they even arrived in, in England, there was a, 
huge kind of love of the same swing bands and they would often visit local nightclubs and that that love of of music um, and dancing came with them um, to England and actually the group had its own band called the Century Bombers um, and it was made up of personnel some of them combat crew um, so naturally the personnel often changed as uh, people got shot down or rotated back home and the Century Bombers were actually so successful that they were commissioned to go on tour to tour other bases um, all, all around the 8th Air Force and even recorded an album in, in London. And there were also multiple hangar dances hosting the likes of Glenn Miller and Bing Crosby. Um, so, yeah, music was a huge part of the culture of the 100th um, and something that I think brought them together. You've got to remember that these guys were in the late teens, early twenties, and they'd been brought up um, mm. on on this, this music, and um, yeah, like it's just it's something to bond over, I suppose, and it's something that reminded them of home, um, which I think is why we see music play such an important role in life on the base. Um, okay, so now um, we get into the the turning point, uh, so. Like I mentioned, um, after the after Black Week, the, it went a little bit quiet on the the long longer range missions, um, but everything geared up again in the early part of 1944 with the arrival of the the P51 Mustangs, which could go with the bombers pretty much all the way to the target. And in the first week of March 1944, the Eighth Air Force launched some some huge raids on Berlin, and the hundred took part in one of these missions on, on the 6th of March 1944 and it suffered its its biggest highest losses of the war so 15 of the group's B-17s um, were lost which was, was the highest the number of any one mission and it really marked a turning point there from then on um, so Colonel John Bennett had just taken over command um, because the last uh, commander, Harding, had been sent back to the US on medical grounds. And John Bennett really established a, a new culture within the 100th. He's described as talking to the men, even some of the, the veterans who'd been there for, for many months. Um, he, he talked to them like they were children and he took everything back to basics. And they went and they practiced formation flying. Um, so they practiced in the air and they also practiced uh, discipline on the ground. They had regular drill sessions, regular PT sessions. And what he wanted to do was to get them working as a team, um, to change this culture of individualists into a, um, a team that could work together and, and survive, basically. And, and his legacy was really carried on um, by Thomas Jeffrey Jr., he was actually only 26 when he took over in May 1944, but he's often regarded as the 100th's most successful commander. And under his reign, the 100th actually started performing really well. They were hitting their targets and losses dropped dramatically. And these two figures are actually often cited as the inspiration for um, Burnley's characters, character um, played by Gregory Peck in 12 O'Clock High. Well, it's a bit of a contentious one. That's a whole massive rabbit hole about where we go, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that in another future show. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, as we were saying, the, the 100th at this point was a completely different outfit to the one that had arrived uh, about a year earlier. Um, but it's important to remember that most of the ground crew were still there. Um, so even though the air crew had had moved moved on, um, this, there was still that, that kind of continuous presence. Um, and over the course of the war, actually, more than 450 replacement crews served with the 100th. So that's a, a, almost 5,000 men. So if, it, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy to kind of think, actually, um, how far they'd come from those original 35 crews that were serving and of the, the instigators of the legend. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, Crosby talks about this period as being, as being one of transition, um, even though the 100th were, had suffered less losses and they were performing better, he kind of said that the swagger of the group had gone and that when the two Buckies um, were shot down in October of 1943, he described the heart of the 100th um, as having stopped beating, which mm. I find quite an interesting quote. Um, but despite 
you know, turning things around with every mission. Um, there were more empty beds, more friends lost, um, and another page of the 100 Bond Group's history was written. And some of these were just passed down um, as flak stories or maybe just, just mentioned in, in post-war memoirs and histories. Um, but together, they all contribute to this legend, this, this legacy of the 100 Bond Group. And I just want to really briefly talk to you about one of those stories. Um, so I found this this out when I was um, in the archives at the at Thorpe Abbott's Museum. And it's about a, a guy called Harold Becker. And he was a navigator for the crew of Hard Luck. And he had been in combat since um, October 1943. He'd come just at the end of Black Week. And he was on his 24th mission um, on the 7th of May. Um, he discovered that it was a mission to Berlin. Um, and for a lot of his crew, um, it would actually be the last mission because they um, had they done a few more than him because he'd been a bit ill. So, yeah, so it was a big mission all around. And um, obviously it was a big mission for the 100 Bond Group. Uh, Berlin was a, was a very dangerous target. But actually for the, the 100, it was a huge success. They bombed the target, came back, and there were no B-17s lost. But for... Becker and for the crew of the Hard Luck, it was a different story. Um, so during that mission, um, their B-17 was just hit by one stray bit of flak and it killed Becker and severely wounded their bombardier. And um, when their bomber landed, um, one of the mechanics describes just all of the ground crew just watching in silence as the plane as the plane pulled up and they they took. Becker's body out and they waited and then went on to clean clean the aircraft. And I, I, I found that story particularly poignant because in the collection of, of the Thorpe Abbott's Museum, there's this letter by Virgil Smith, who was that mechanic. And he describes how when he went in to clean um, to clean up after after the, the mission, he found a watch which he assumed must have belonged to the killed navigator Harold Becker. And for whatever reason, he kept hold of it. And he would then later in 1983 donate it to Thorpe Abbott's museum. And he felt that that was, was the proper home for it to go to. But I just, I, I think that, um, that that kind of represents how a, one single death could impact so many people. Obviously for Becker's family back home, he was from a massive family of, of 12. They would have felt his death particularly hard. But then also for the ground personnel who didn't experience combat firsthand, but they experienced the after effects of combat. They're the ones cleaning out the bombers and patching up the flak holes. And their stories are told in, in the history of the 100 very, very well. But actually they they suffered and they had to keep hold of these memories um so yeah i just wanted to point out that story um because i found it quite effective when i when i read it um in the archives um so i'm just gonna wrap up um by just talking briefly about the the post-war life of the 100 bomb group so so after the 100 um, finished their, their missions in April of 1945. They went on to conduct six uh, Chowhound missions, which were missions to drop food parcels over the Netherlands. And, and then by June um, 1945, most of the crews had left, most of the personnel were kind of packing up and winding down the base. And from that moment on, really, the, the written history of the 100 emerges. So even in, during the war itself, there, there was an effort to compile all these anecdotes into a book. Um, and we've, we've got two that came out in, in the, a year or two after the war, one story of the century and one Contrails, my war record. And these are uh, certainly Contrails is quite a sanitized account of the hundreds time at Thorpe Abbott, but that is the one that was distributed amongst veterans. And it's almost become like the official history of the hundred. And lots of the stories that we now associate with the legend can be found in that book. And I found this quote by John A. Miller, who's a 100 Bomb Group veteran, quite poignant. Um, he describes how nothing in his life has ever compared to those months that seem so short now, but seem like an eternity at a time. At, at the time. Everything in life that's followed has been an anticlimax. No friends have ever compared to the buddies I had then. then. The sensation of life has never been so keenly experienced, and the experience of death has never been so keenly regretted. And wow. I think that really sums it up how what yeah. this period meant to those men um even though it was just the tiniest fraction of their life it had 
embedded so deeply into their memories that even today, if we've still got some 100 Bond Group veterans and they still um, talk about the 100, they still come back to Fourth Habits. Um, we had a veteran come back um, last year. Um, so it, that's that history has never left them. So I think that speaks for itself really, the impact that, that this story has had on their life. Um, so I just want to quickly give a brief overview of the 100's war record. So as we know, the 8th Air Force su suffered horrendous losses during the Second World War. Um, 26,000 men were killed, which worked out about 7.42% of the air crew that served um, with the 8th, um, which is actually a, a huge figure compared to even the Marine Corps in the Pacific. Um, the 100th lost 229 fortresses, uh, or 177 of those were lost in combat, and 732 airmen were killed or missing in action. And this isn't the highest loss of, of the 8th Air Force, but it is the third highest losses. And the only one groups that suffered more were the 91st um, at Bassingbourne, home of the Memphis Bell, and the 96th at Snetterton Heath. But both of these groups were actually in combat um, quite a few months before uh, the 100th. So if we actually look at um, the groups that were sent over at the same time as the 100, that they come out on top every time. Um, and they, they were, again, notorious for losing heavily on a handful of missions. Mm -hmm. And the worst one was that um, March mission to Berlin, where 15 B-17s were down. But actually, that statistic wasn't the worst. So the 445th Bomb Group lost 25 B-24s on one mission to Kassel. And they, that has that the record of being the highest single mission loss in the 8th Air Force. So even though the 100 suffered heavily, they didn't break any records. Um, but I think as this presentation's kind of showed, it wasn't necessarily the number of casualties that uh, added to this legend. It was a number of things. It was the huge personalities who not only created an attitude and it gave flavor a flavor to this legend during the war, but after the war, they were the ones who told the stories and met at reunions and um, wrote down their experiences. Um, and then we also have some of these um, anecdotes that come out of various missions, and we have that huge loss at Munster. Um, so it's all of these things that kind of compounded, I think, that really gave the hundreds its kind of special qualities. Um, so again, I'm just going to finish up with this quote. It may be that all bomb groups were much alike. Certainly their day-to-day -day lives and missions were similar. People who are in other groups and know of our friendships, the visiting, the reunions and the continuing esprit, esprit tell me that the 100th may have had something different. It did. And I think that that's uh, mm. certainly the case um, th th for for those veterans after the war who, who met at reunions like this one. As early as 1947, they were meeting at reunions, which is incredible. Um, and for those veterans who returned to Thorpe Abbotts, um, where the, a memorial museum was created in 1982, they had a place to go to reflect. Um, it's almost like a pilgrimage for a lot of these veterans to come back um, to the place where so much action happened and so many B-17s took off never to return. And finally, um, there's this lovely quote from Captain Bucky Elton, who who made a trip back to Thorpe Abbotts in 1982. And he describes how one day while he was there, he went out to the tower alone and it was raining and the low clouds raced by. I climbed up to the top where we used to wait for them to come back. I must have been there for an hour and a half. And then I swear, I heard them all come back. Patrick, Adams, Schmollenbach, Barnhill, Knox, Biddick, all of them. I couldn't see them up there in the clouds, but their engines made the old tower tremble. One slow pass and they were gone. I do not expect you to understand this, but you must believe it. I have the feeling they will return because they are being remembered. And again, the final point I think is that the, the legacy of the Bloody Hundred it was sustained and it has been passed down because of that reason. Because not only does it talk about the story of one of the most kind of incredible groups of, of the war, it also is a way to remember those who never made it back. And I think that's probably important for those veterans who have continued the legacy. Well, brilliant stuff, Hattie. Um, so my first question to you is about your work with the museum, because it's, it occurs to me in some ways that you've got a similar issue that John Orloff had with Masters of Yale, in that you've got to have a narrative story, because you've got to convey, you know, as you said there, 26,000 young men died, and it's X number of aircraft and X number of airfields, but that's just 
data, isn't it? You've got to bring people in with a with a story of of human beings and what they went through. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming, therefore, you can understand exactly that the 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 deal that the, the issues John Orloff and the creators are, are, were faced with to try and tell that story. So how, how do you deal with it at the American Air Museum? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it is a really, really tricky um, situation. It's a, a tri tricky to balance the various audiences we have at a place like the American Air Museum. And our approach has been to, um, to tell individual stories around each aircraft. So we have a B-17, a B-24 in our hangar and we we tell stories of individuals who flew or were associated with that aircraft and we tell that through personal objects um that that kind of tell their own stories um so it, it's very very difficult though to narrow down who we're going to talk about because there are so many different veterans who have donated objects to the museum and i wish we could could choose all of them but I think uh, kind of from a curator's perspective, you go with the, the story that would resonate most with people. Um, there's one object, for example, which is a, a gold plated Bible and it's engraved on it with, um, I think, the message like this, this Bible will keep you safe or something. And it was actually found by uh, a young child um, during the war. Um, just on the outskirts of a B-17 crash site and it belonged to one of the crew members and that boy had, had kept that that Bible with him um, not really knowing what to do with it and an object like that has so much meaning um, both because it tell, talks about that relationship between local people and Americans yeah. um, but it also tells you about just the destructive nature um, of an air accident in this case it was a uh, they crashed on, on um, landing um, so yeah, you, you go with, with the objects that can that give you an insight into this history. And, and I imagine that that's kind of what the uh, producers and the writers of Masters of the Air thought. They, they thought, what kind of scene or, or little anecdote can we use that, that kind of opens up broader themes and gets people thinking about the air war in a much broader way? Um, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> uh, indeed, and, and it's an eternal kind of thing to deal with that how you convey the complexity of enormity of world war ii in a way that's meaningful for for individuals but um we said we would talk about the impact of the tv series on on the museum and tourism in general and is it something you think is going to make a difference to, to your work at thorpe abbott's and duxford and all the other air bases that have things as you know, paul bingley down at uh, in in ridgewell and things like that so uh, is there is there a bit of a buzz I mean, among the museum creator curator world in the UK that this is going to be the beginning of something a bit a bit positive? I very much hope so. I think before the series came out, there was a kind of expectancy that we might see an increase in visitors, and a lot of that was based on the effect of Band of Brothers yeah. um, on tourism in, in Normandy, for example. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to be on that scale because it's it's a different era. It would be I don't know whether as many people are going to watch Masters of the Air, um, but we are, are sitting on, on so many amazing museums that tell so many fascinating stories. And my hope is that someone will watch Masters of the Air and think, wow, this, this heritage is on my doorstep. I can go out and actually discover those true stories. And I've certainly, from my experience as a, a volunteer at Thorpe Abbott's, um, I was there last weekend and we had, probably kind of four times the number of visitors that we would usually have on, on a rainy day in March. So I think I think we're in for a busy summer at least. Um, and in terms of the American Air Museum as, as well, I think um, we're, we're seeing an increase in American visitors and certainly a lot of inquiries from Americans regarding um, research into their own family histories because they've discovered an eighth Air Force connection through watching the show. And that's potentially um a gold mine for museums in the future because we've talked about it on the channel is that the veterans themselves maybe kept things but weren't they weren't the people to digitalize their diaries and scan their photos the children of the veterans didn't necessarily do that either but the grandchildren this is a sweeping generalization generalization they are the ones that are scanning the documents i'm thinking of the work chloe did about her grandfather frank murphy and you know republishing the book and things like that is that potentially great grandchildren as well as grandchildren will be the ones who will come into places like Duxford and Thorpe Abbott's with here's all my great grandfather's stuff I've digitalized it for you here it is on a you know USB stick and that's 
for museum staff like yourself, that must be a really exciting uh, era that there is all this potential documentation out there yet to be discovered. Yeah, and I'm seeing it every day. Um, so we have a, a database I've called the American Air Museum website where we, we have thousands and thousands of American servicemen and, and women um, recorded on that database. And the great thing about it is that anyone can upload information, upload photographs. And since Masters of the Air has come out, I have seen an increase in the number of people uploading photos of their, their mm. grandfather or even their great grandfather. And um, yeah, I, I'm certainly seeing a lot more interest from younger generations. And I, I think that's that's great. I think that might just be the spark that we really needed to, to carry on this, um, this legacy um and uh, again i hope that that translates into people actually coming to visit and seeing the real history yeah thank you um i want to go back to a subject we kind of half tackled we talked about the cooperation between the civilians uh, around the bases and and, and the the bomb the bombardment groups but um it, we kind of asked john this yesterday but it was towards the end of the show and we were running out of time but it, yeah one of the criticisms of masters of the air has been the portrayal of the raf and the old the whole rivalry between the british and the americans and daylight and nighttime and precision and area have you got a particular opinion? Well, scott grimwood's question is how does hattie see and interpret the interaction between the u.s servicemen and the british uh, but we'll kind of deal with the military aspect is it is it something that you think is something that needs to be discussed yeah, um, I would, I would have appreciated a little bit more of a chance for them to develop the a relationship between yeah. um, the British service personnel and the Americans. Um, obviously, we do see a little bit of a, of a more positive take on the relationship between Harry Crosby and um, Subaltern Wingate. I think her name is, but um, yeah, yeah. yeah, again, it's it's kind of more from a romantic angle, um, and I do. I, I think the pub scene, for example, um, where they have that they're bust up. There's there I have read examples of that happening, and there certainly was a rivalry, particularly when it came to women. So there was a, a sense among the Brit Brits that the Americans were were paid too much, and their uniforms were much nicer. So obviously they were going to attract the attention of British women. Um, but I don't think that I, I remember any any examples of it actually kind of leading to brawls. I think the Americans were given quite a good indoctrination before they actually arrived in, in the UK as to how they should handle British civilians and British um, personnel. So I, I do think there is a slight injustice there. And I hope that that portrayal um, of that relationship in mean, Masters of the Air isn't um, kind of taken as verbatim, because I think actually, on the whole, the relationships between the two Two nationalities were civil. There was this idea that we were both, um, particularly between the RAF and the Eighth Air Force, that we were both bombing the same targets. Yeah. Um, and um, often, I've read of accounts where the Americans are actually they they sit laying in bed in the Nissan huts at night, and they can hear the RAF bombers going out overhead, and they're kind of thinking, "Oh, well, rather, rather the, you than me, mate," because they know <laughs> they've got it just as tough, if not tougher. So, yeah, um, I I. I wish that there had perhaps been a bit more development um, and also a bit more development between the British civilians uh, and the the men of the 100 bomb group because we've got, got some fantastic accounts of yeah. relationships but you know it's only a nine-part series they can't include everything well it's it, it the whole thing is there's always I get it or every week every show I do is why didn't you discuss this you could have talked about that the, the, you know the what about you know what of course there's always more to talk about there's always more you can show there's always other things other directions you can go and I think for me I didn't really see those scenes with the RAF as being insulting. I thought it was sort of banter, and and yeah. and, and British units would make jokes about Americans, and and it, there's there's a difference in banter and crack, as the Irish would say, and and absolute insulting. And I think that that's historians have got a little bit bogged down over the years with the relationship between the Montgomerys and the Pattons and the Doolittles and the this and Harris's things like that. And there, there's sometimes they're reading a bit more into these relationships than actually it was. Is that generally there was a pretty pretty good working relationship and I, that extended from the you know the air marshals at the top right the way down to the the, the corporals and sergeants and and flight air crews at the bottom i think personally mm -hmm. but, um so we will bring things to an end um at some point so um we've talked about the your work in the museum we talked about the hope that this will will bring for the uh for the tourism to the region 
any other things that you think that this will do or you think should be be part of our discussions as we move forward about strategic bombing and combined bomber offensive? Are there areas that we, we should be talking about that we aren't or need to be explored? Or are we kind of covering most of it right now? Yeah, I think you're doing a great job. It's, um, like you said, it's hard to, to cover everything in great detail. Um, um, I suppose my my personal interest just uh, the kind of interest of mine is, has been the role of of women particularly in the eighth air force but i know you did a a, a great um interview with sophie green, on sophie green yeah. 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 yeah um and um also the the, the guys on the ground I, I know it's obviously doesn't relate at all to the to the the kind of strategy of the air war but i think um it's a, perhaps a, a look at how important that each of those mechanics, even down to the, the kind of the cooks um, and the, the guys who worked in the PX were um, to the morale. And I think morale is something that is so important, but often quite under underrated in air war operations. Mm -hmm. What made those guys get into their bombers day after yeah. day? Um, so I think there's something perhaps to do to say and do a little bit more digging about about morale and um, combat motivation. Well, that, well, that's what Don Miller said on Monday, is that that is the question that is impossible to answer, is what did what made those men walk up across that tarmac and hoist themselves up into the nose of the B-17 or B-24, or for that matter, a Lancaster or a Halifax, and do it again and again and again? And it's, a, you know, you, we can kind of understand, begin to understand the methodology behind strategic bombing and which areas of the aircraft were safer than others, et cetera, et cetera. But the... Mm -hmm. The mindset is hard and and you know for example after you'd seen episode three or four and you go back into work and i know you took robbie and and, and matt from uh, fighting on film into the b17g there recently what was it like kind of walking past the b17 the first time after you'd sort of seen those episodes because i'm sure even someone like yourself who is incredibly well versed in what the eighth air force did that visual representation, as we said right at the beginning there, must have kind of blown your mind as to what it was really about flying over. Was, was there some goosebumps when you walked past it that next morning? Absolutely, yeah. It was um, the first time I'd, I'd been in, into the B-17 since the series. And it was, it, yeah, it, I saw it in a completely new perspective. Um, I think when you're, you're moving through the B-17, you're so paranoid with trying not to bump into not stuff again. <laughs> but actually you you kind of um after watching the series i got a, a new appreciation for actually having to do that in all flying gear um but then also just um having to move between the different compartments of the bomber um and also being um tethered both in oxygen and also your kind of heated flight suit to the to the bomber so i think it was just much more like the kind of smaller details of working um on such uh, in, inhospitable conditions that I think uh, that Master of the Air kind of brought to life for me. I think that, you know, we're going down another rabbit hole, but I think for me, who knows a little bit about the 8th Air Force, the complexity of how many jobs there were within a B-17, how many things you had to plug in and move and disconnect and keep functioning. You know, I'm thinking of those old kind of the 60s TV, verse, TV show version of 12 o'clock high, where you knew the actors were kind of sitting on two you know, apple crates with like a stick in front of them. And there was no sense of creating an accurate cockpit around them, really. But this has really given me the understanding of, you know, that how how technical that job was, how mm. skilled, the, forget about the bravery, which I'm not saying forget about the bravery, but the, the kind of the degree level of, of training these guys had, the navigators, the bombardiers, that has come through in absolute spades um, yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, and the G, the physics, the sheer G, G forces and physics, and the and the the jamming of the B, the ball turret and the piles of ammunition, spent ammunition all over the floor, and that that has been fantastic. But we're we're going down a rabbit hole, Hattie. It's been great talking to you. I, I've already had loads of people in the sidebar saying, "Bring her back, bring her back, do more stuff." So <laughs> Thank we, you. If you want to come back, we're we're thinking yeah, of doing a panel it. discussion about the historical reaction to the show. We'll, we'll, we'll try and set something up. But it's been great talking to you. Folks, we've got one more show tomorrow and this week. Uh, Stephen Rosenbaum, the special effects a, a wizard, is on tomorrow with an um, amazing PowerPoint he'll have, pointing out all the details of this and that and how they did that visual recreation that we just spoke to about. So that'll be tomorrow. That's a seven, uh, 6 p.m. UK time uh, because of time difference and where Stephen is over in the Pacific. So thank you, uh, Hattie. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. I will see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Bernard for World War II TV. Say so don't forget to like, click like and subscribe. Check out the link to the American Air Museum in the link description below, and I'll see you all again tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.
Bye.